take your Bibles with me this morning. Turn to Matthew chapter 7. We have reached the conclusion of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and we will be looking at the final parts of it this morning in our series on simple obedience. Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 all the way down through verse 27. Let me start in verse 13, since that's the beginning of this conclusion. I'm going to read the whole thing. Follow along as I read. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, narrow or difficult the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose. The winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. This passage is a warning, and I, I don't know about you, but we can, I, I have different reactions to warnings when I see them. A few, oh, I guess it's about a month ago, I was uh, lamenting the fact that I'm playing golf and my Golf over the years has started to trigger arthritis in the right side of my hand. My pinky is all crooked and bent out of shape from evidently holding the club like this and gripping too tightly. So I'm not supposed to be getting arthritis, so I'm talking to people about what you do about that. And I was talking to, uh, we'll call her my pharmaceutical friend, about the arthritis in my finger, and uh, she recommended a certain arthritis cream. Voltaren is the arthritis cream. So I went, looked up Voltaren, and I'm standing there looking at this tube of stuff that costs about $25, and then I'm looking for the generic brand, right? There's got to be something that's cheaper. And sure enough, they had it, and then I, I, I took it home, I bought it, I opened it up, and I was reading the directions. How often am I supposed to apply, apply this stuff, you know, and, and how much? And for some reason, it struck my eye. This, this, this cream has a lot of warnings that come with it. And so I, you know, I started reading some of them. And, and some of them, because it's a non-steroidal, um, anti-inflammatory uh, drug, you know, you get all of the typical ones about, you know, stomach bleedings and heart attacks and strokes and stuff like that. Um, and, I, you know, I blew past those. That, that, that didn't bother me. Because um, I, I, I figured it's for, you know, it says 60 plus and stuff like that. I'm not there yet. So the rest of it, though, talked about a liver warning. And so I'm like, well, what is the liver warning with this product. And it, it says that liver damage may occur if you apply this in more uh, amount than is specified or for longer than directed. And so I was like, huh, what does, what does that mean? So I looked that up further. And here you're, it says, you know, don't apply this longer than 21 days. 
and in no more than four amounts, and make sure you're at least something like 12 inches away from your heart when you're applying this, you know? So <laughs> all of these sorts of things were causing a little bit more consternation as I read the warning label. And I went back to my pharmaceutical friend, and I asked her, what's with the warnings on this thing? Is this safe? And she assured me it was. It really didn't apply to me, and so I'm using it. Um, <laughs> it helps some. I, I'm, probably not, I'm not using it the four times a day that I'm probably supposed to. I'm a little too scared for my liver. <laughs> but as I was thinking about the warning labels on that, uh, well, and, and the funny side note is, too, I talked to, one of our other friends was there, and I asked her, because she was thinking about buying this stuff too, and I asked her if she got some and used it, and she indicated to me, no, after reading the warning label, I stayed off of that completely. <laughs> As I thought about that, those reactions, I think, are all typical of how we hear and think about warnings, even scriptural warnings. Our responses are the same. Some of us will just neglect them because we think that they don't apply, right? I'm not 60, so this doesn't apply to me. I, this isn't me that Jesus is talking about here, so I'm just going to blow right past it. Others of us are freaked out by them. They scare us. The warning scares us, and sometimes it can even produce doubt or fear of even entering in. And then there's some of us, and I think this is many of us, who, who like myself with the cream, wanted an assurance that I'm okay, right? Like, I'm okay to use this, so please assure me that, again, I'm okay. And as we hear what Jesus says in this text, I, I think for some it causes us, and it maybe should cause you to fear a little bit. Some of us, again, blow right past it. It's not me. And, and then other of us, others of us are going, please, Lord, uh, give me the assurance that I'm okay. But all such responses to what Jesus says here fail to do what Jesus intended by these words. He wants all of us to hear these words, but not just hear them. As he stated at the conclusion as he started this conclusion enter through the narrow gate that gate represents the kingdom it represents the way of jesus christ and he beckons us to enter by believing in him by trusting him by embracing his way walking his path and that's not a take it or leave it proposition because our eternal destiny is at stake so with the rest of this conclusion to this sermon he gives one more command in verse 15, and then he illustrates it in a number of ways. All of these warn us not to reject what he has taught and commanded. Don't blow past this. And he wants all of us to hear his warning, but more importantly, to heed the warning with our actions. So what's the command? Well, it's found right there at the beginning of verse 15. Watch out for false prophets. Watch out. Be on guard. Be warned. Beware of. Pay attention to. Have your mind alert and ready, Jesus is saying here. Jesus calls us to have a spiritually to have at the front of our minds the truth that there are individuals out there who want to lead us astray. Always have that somewhere in your mind. This is, I've, I've talked about uh, in the past men's minds and, and women's minds, and this is one of the strengths that women have over men is that they're able to ponder and think about lots of things at the exact same time. Like they can be doing one thing and three other things can be floating through their mind at the same time and they can concentrate on all of those things. That's a, I have no idea how you do that. But they can do that, right? And Jesus is saying here, have always somewhere open in your mind the reality of this spiritually. In the biblical world, prophets were a bit different than kings or priests. We know all of these kinds of figures from our 
Old Testaments and our New Testaments, but the king was the, in, in the nation of Israel was the one at the very top, and he represented essentially God to the people. This is why uh, how the king went, the nation went. If the king was doing evil before the Lord, he was leading the nation into evil before the Lord. He represented God as the leader of his people. His behavior would represent the nation. David was described as one who was truly devoted to God. He was a man after God's own heart. The priests, on the other hand, were the ones who, in a sense, served the people worked in the tabernacle and the temple, but they were working on behalf of the people in their communication, in their offering, and in their right standing back to God. In a sense, the priest was the conduit to go from the people to God in communication. The prophets, on the other hand, received communication and revelation from God and were that conduit then to the people. Some of their ministry was directly special revelation, where God would say to them, go to my people and say something. He would give them direct revelation. Sometimes that revelation was about the future. Most of the time, it wasn't about the future, it was about the law, and taking the law and interpreting the law and then applying it to the people's lives and how they lived. This is where you are not trusting and obeying God. This is where you are. And so their message was one of encouragement, but also exhortation. Very similar to what preaching does today. And so Jesus is giving this warning to keep his followers vigilant as to what they should listen to and what they should follow. This is really a a command to you about how you listen to somebody like me. So as I preach this passage, I'm not going to say I don't like this passage, but it's a warning to me too, very strongly, because it does put before me the responsibility of when I say, thus says the Lord, or I expound on what the word of God says, I am speaking as a mouthpiece of God's word to his people, and God takes that incredibly serious. Many today in the church think that, well, I could maybe obey this particular warning by simply avoiding church altogether, right? If I don't go, then I don't have to worry about listening to a false prophet, Besides, I have the Word of God, and I have the Holy Spirit, and I can interpret this thing, and and I'm sure I can figure this out myself. There are problems with that. Primarily, God gifted pastors and teachers to the church, Ephesians 4, for the edification of the saints, to build the saints up, to build his body. Further, Not only are we called to explain, teach, preach his word, but most in the congregation, and this this is a problem with, honestly, this is a problem with preachers today too, but most lack the background understanding of how to interpret all of Scripture properly. There is something to the collective wisdom of church history and how we understand Scripture that God expects those who are going to communicate it and who are going to educate others in it to have taken on so that they can understand and interpret correctly the Word of God. God expects those people to go through a pretty lengthy and extensive preparation process before they do that. You can look all throughout Scripture, whether we're talking about Moses or Joshua or Samuel or Elisha or the apostles or Paul or Timothy and Titus. All of them spent years and years of their lives in preparation before God ever sent them out to start speaking for him. And how these teachers come and what they can teach easily will lead people astray because we are very naturally susceptible to the deceptions that Jesus warns about. And that's where I want to really spend the bulk of this message today. Here's the command, watch out for false prophets. But what is it that they will deceive us about? And the illustrations, I think, play at this. There's three deceptions that we are susceptible to 
coming off of Jesus' command to enter through the narrow gate and following then this command to watch out for false prophets in reference to this. The first deception that we face that we can easily be led astray on is this, the deception of appearance. Jesus says that they, these false prophets, come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. They come as sheep while being ferocious wolves. I mean, this is an illustration from our childhood, right? You could go back to Aesop's fables themselves, and there's always the story on our cartoons of the sheep being susceptible to attack by some ferocious wolf who is trying to get at them, right? And even might put on sheep's clothing to come after the sheep. Personified here, these wolves attempt to capture the unsuspecting. That means that you won't recognize them very easily at first. They look and sound like everyone else. They look and sound like sheep. They will be pastors and have followings of people with them. I don't think Jesus here is warning, uh, just as an aside, I don't think he's warning about us getting too worried about every single little aspect of our theology, right? We're going to disagree about certain things, and certain people we read and certain pastors we listen to will disagree, us, disagree with us on the finer points of theology, I don't think that's what Jesus is talking about here. If you're looking for the church where you're going to find the preacher who will agree with you on all your finer points of theology, you're going to have to probably attend the church of me, myself, and I, right? Like, that's all it's going to be made of because Christians will disagree over some of those minor points. But on the main and major focus of life and ministry, Jesus is warning about what preachers are saying and teaching, specifically about that gate and that way that Jesus has just narrowed very significantly. What are they saying about that? That's where the warning comes, on the tail of what he has just said about this narrow gate. What's the content of what is coming out of the mouth of the preacher? Is it primarily self is it primarily you? Is it primarily your success, your prosperity, your pleasure, your fulfillment? You can turn on the TV later today and watch pastors on big networks and they will talk a lot about you. And they will talk about finding your best life and it will sound a lot like fulfillment and pleasure and success and fame and money. That doesn't sound like the narrow road that Jesus has been laying out in this sermon. I think that's what he's talking about. We as your leaders and our as preachers are under shepherds according to 1 Peter 5. We are under the great shepherd Jesus Christ and like God through the leading of his son, Jesus Christ, as we preached in Psalm 23, we are granted to the church to protect the sheep. And so he takes very seriously our leading. So how do we, how do we recognize the false teacher? How do we recognize this deception? Here is the truth revealer in verses 16 to 20. Ask this question, what type of fruit does their life produce? Good fruit will come from healthy trees. That's what Jesus is saying here. Bad fruit will come from unhealthy ones. We don't see this much anymore because it's hard to tell if your fruit is good or not when you go to the store. You're not seeing it on the tree. You're not seeing it on the vine. I was frustrated this last week because I ended up getting a watermelon and it wasn't so good. And I just didn't want to take the time to return the half cut up watermelon back to Walmart and say, give me another one. Walmart will actually take them back. Trust me, I've done it before when you get a bad enough one. But we don't get to look at the tree or the vine or whatever to see is the plant healthy or not. But that's the illustration from this agrarian society that Jesus uses. What unmasks such false teachers and prophets? And while we may think that the teaching can undo the wolf, Jesus goes in a different direction here. He doesn't look at their teaching. 
He says, what fruit does their life bear? We might think that fruit should be interpreted by size, by numbers. And sometimes fruit is reflected in those things. But Jesus emphasizes throughout this sermon, he's not talking about numbers and size. He's talking about the fruit of the life, the individual life. Do they practice what Jesus has just said? Does their life align with his way? Thus he is talking about what can be seen in the actions of the teacher regarding the very commands that he has just presented, or presented in this sermon. They're very similar to the kinds of things that are to characterize an elder or a deacon in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. You're to look on what you can see on the outside because, because as you get to know this person over a lengthy period of time, what comes out of their life in their actions and in their speech reveals the heart. And so what fruit does their actions produce? Does the life reflect a preoccupation for the things of this world or God's kingdom? Do they practice disciplines to be seen and heard by others or to be seen only by God? Jesus talked about that in this sermon. Do they demonstrate love for their enemies? Are they willing to seek reconciliation when they have done wrong and are confronted with it or do they hide from their sin? These are the kinds of fruit that should be coming out of the life of the teacher or the preacher. You can go on some of our streaming services right now and find exposés on rather large ministries and rather large pastors around the world who have been exposed as frauds of the exact kinds of false prophets Jesus is talking about here. They have impressive ministries. Their songs are incredible songs that we might even sing, and yet they're being led by men who are false. The message may be accurate, but if the life doesn't match Jesus' message, it will lead sheep astray. That's what Jesus is saying here. So don't be too easily wowed by a preacher's talents, his speaking prowess, or even the amazing deeds, as we'll see here in a minute, that he's able to do. The real test is the fruit of their life. What characterizes them? Because both the life being lived and the teaching taught by the pastor must be in line with what scripture demands because they will give account before God Hebrews 13 17 James 3 1 so be on guard look at our lives Paul says our lives are to imitate Christ's life that doesn't mean it's gonna be perfect all of the time but look at the direction of the life a second deception that Jesus warns about here that we are susceptible to are claims. Not just appearance, but claims. This is verses 21 to 23. Not everyone who says and calls on me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. There will be some who say Jesus is Lord, and they're basing that on their supernatural giftings. Jesus is clarifying here that not everyone who names him as Lord or even calls on him as Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. And I believe that this scene represents well what judgment day will entail. People will be gathered who think that they are right with God. They have done all kinds of things and they've even prayed to God and they have called him Lord. They have done so much for Jesus that they must have a relationship with him. And notice, these aren't just simple good deeds that these people have done. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, verse 22, did we not prophesy in your name? And did we not cast out demons in your name? And did we not perform many powerful signs and miracles in your name? These folks claim and are able even to produce supernatural works accomplished through their lives and through their ministries. This passage reminds us that not all supernatural works are actually the work of God. You go back to Exodus, even when Moses is leading the people out of Egypt, right? He's able to do certain things with these signs that God 
gave him to perform, but who else could do those things? The Egyptians could do those things. The Egyptians could turn the water into blood. The Egyptians could turn their rods into snakes. They were supernaturally empowered, but it wasn't by God. In each of these works, the person is invoking the very name of Jesus. In his name, they've prophesied and overcome the demonic and displayed acts of power. But we're reminded here that great works don't reveal relationship. Here's the truth revealer that Jesus gives. Here's the overcomer of the deception. What characterizes your daily life and decisions? And here's the contrast in the the passage. Works of lawlessness, or as the NIV translates it, the fact that they are evildoers, or ones who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Verse 21. Jesus goes back to the very orientation of our lives, seen in the actions, not the big attention-seeking action that's on public display, Jesus wants the everyday action. All of us have, know people or have friends that, are, that try to impress, right? Like this person tries to impress by giving the big gift or having the great display of something. And they're trying to impress others with this big action. And yet in the day-to-day life, they really don't want anything to do with you as seen by how much time they spend investing in the relationship. It's not real. That's what Jesus says here. I never knew you. What a condemnation on judgment day. You see, the miracle worker here didn't want Jesus. They wanted the attention. They wanted the fame. They wanted the notoriety. So how is it that we know Jesus and we are known by Jesus? Jesus tells us here, we do it by submitting our lives to his Father's will. Only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Those who live for self, disregarding what is clearly revealed in Scripture as how they are to live, these are called evildoers or those who live according to lawlessness. And this is the great tragedy of Judgment Day. Judgment Day is all about works. Everywhere you go in Scripture, right here, we see it. But if you go over to Paul's teaching in 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to what? Give account for the works done in our body. All of us will give account for that. Revelation chapter 20, verse 12, at that great white throne judgment, everyone is judged based on what? According to their works. Works is the point of judgment. But it's not about doing enough works to earn your salvation. Here's the the twist on Judgment Day. Only only one person's works, Jesus' works, have accomplished enough to actually enter into the presence of God. That's why we enter into his presence by believing Jesus Christ, embracing his death, his resurrection for our salvation, his way, his teaching. We enter through him. He's the narrow gate. That's what gets us into what? The book of life that's in Revelation chapter 20. But here's how the works reveal that. Our works show and demonstrate whether we truly know Christ. Imagine a scenario with me where a owner of a company is about to retire and he's thinking through who am I going to pick as my successor? Now let's assume that the the company, let's just assume that he can do that, right? I know there's going to be boards and all kinds of stuff in this day and age, but let's just assume he's got sole discretion over this. And he pulls aside his five ranking employees that he's going to decide between who he's going to give this company to. And he's He's going to evaluate them. And he might even tell them ahead of time, I'm going to look at you and not just give a performance evaluation, but observe over a period of time and make a decision about who I'm going to hand this company off to. There's going to be those who try to impress this guy with their great deeds, their ability to sell, their ability to produce. 
But I would suggest to you that the owner, especially if he's started this company and this is his company, isn't so much about just the production and just the success. He's going to look for the individual whose whole life embraces the ethos of that company. That's who he wants to hand that off to. He wants that person to take his legacy and carry it forward. You see, on Judgment Day, God's not impressed with who did the most good deeds. He's impressed with the person who has embraced Jesus Christ, embraced him because Jesus is the ethos of God, the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. God is all about Jesus Christ. And our right standing with God is all about Jesus Christ. It's not about perfection and performance or accomplishing the greatest things. The question this passage is asking is, is your life oriented to Christ and his teachings? We're to seek our Heavenly Father's kingdom. We are to seek his will. And to claim a relationship isn't the same thing as having a true relationship that seeks to do the will of our Heavenly Father. Claims about who we know and who we are can be very deceptive. The third deception is found in verses 24 to 27, and it's this. It's the deception of knowledge. The one who knows the teachings of Jesus. The final illustration really sums up the call of this entire sermon, and I think it's probably the most famous of the illustrations that Jesus uses here in the sermon. We learned this one in children's Sunday school, right? The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock, right? Three times. And then the rains came a-tumbling down. The rains came down and the floods came up and the rains came down and the floods came up. And the house on the rock, what? Stood firm. And the foolish man built his house on the sand and the rains came tumbling down and as the floods came up, the house on the sand fell flat. And we teach this to the young children. I don't know if we still do anymore. I don't know what best doing back there with that, but that's what I learned in Sunday school. And then there was the third stanza. So build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ and the blessings will come down and the blessings come down as the prayers go up. So build your life on the Lord. Sounds a little bit like the prosperity gospel there in the third stanza, but <laughs> we'll just stop it at the first two. But it illustrates well this teaching of Jesus here and what he's trying to get across and what his point is. The wise man built his house upon the rock. We have fun playing and learning the actions, but we're teaching here a very profound truth and a truth that has eternal consequence to it. The truth Jesus illustrates is the complete destruction of the life built and lived foolishly, the house on the sand. Both lives have heard the teachings of Jesus. Both the foolish response and the wise response hear his words. They know what Jesus taught. Many of us know the words of Jesus. We know the teachings of Jesus. Yet we are easily deceived if we think that that is enough. Because knowledge puffs up. Knowledge isn't enough. What was the difference between the wise builder and the foolish builder? The truth revealer of this deception is this. Do you know Jesus' teachings or are you practicing them? The wise man hears these words of mine, Jesus' very words that he's given in this sermon, and puts them into practice. The verb that dominates verses 15 down through 27, it occurs nine times in this stretch of text. It doesn't manifest itself in English so well because so many of our translations translate it with different English words. But it's that Greek word, poieo, do, make, produce. It's translated in our text here as do or produce or practice. 
It's the same Greek verb occurring over and over and over again in this part of the text. It means to put Jesus' teachings into practice by focusing one's life on the will of the Father that he has just revealed in this sermon. A person who believes in Jesus and has a relationship with Jesus does what Jesus says. Here's the simple main idea this morning. It's four words. Jesus' followers follow Jesus. Jesus' followers follow Jesus. It's that simple, but it's incredibly profound. That's what Jesus is after. This statement is, it begins to follow someone. Uh, you have to trust them. I'm not going to follow a person I don't trust. It begins by trusting Jesus. But what is that trust? What is Jesus calling us to believe? And that's what our English translations typically use to convey that idea, believe. But here's the difficulty with believe in modern day English. We so easily equate belief with knowing. And so I say I believe something just because I have a head knowledge of it. But this is the very thing Jesus is saying and warning against here. It's not just about knowing or hearing. It has to be put into practice. And that's where biblical belief and biblical trust is different than our modern understanding of this. I think what better would capture the idea is you must place your trust in Jesus. You must give your loyalty to Jesus. A few weeks ago, it was uh, Memorial Day, and... You know, one of the great arguments at the Burgraff household is trying to pick what movie we are going to watch on a given night, right? We'll sit there and, oh, well, do you want to watch that one? And then the other two that have veto power, one will veto, right? And so then they'll pick a movie, and then the other two that have veto power will, nope, I don't want that one. And we do this, this can go on for like a half an hour, right? Where you're trying to figure out what movie you're going to watch, and it's never agreed upon. But it was Memorial Day, and I... I used my powers of persuasion to convince Emily to watch Saving Private Ryan because you need to watch a good war movie on Memorial Day. Oh, it's awesome, right? To watch Saving Private Ryan, great guy movie. Emily actually enjoyed it, so hopefully we'll get war, more war movies down the road. But the opening scene, if you've seen that movie of that invasion of the beaches of Normandy, specifically Omaha Beach that's portrayed there, is... Uh, it's some of the most astounding uh, filming ever done, right? Of, of making you just feel like you're there. And how these men, and this is the trick, how these soldiers stormed those beaches at the direction of their leadership regardless of what it meant for their life because so many by the hundreds and thousands were mowed down just to take those beaches. But that's what a soldier does a soldier is loyal to his officers. They ingrain that in you if an army is going to be successful or a military is going to be successful at all. You follow orders. You give your life to that officer and he gets to dictate what you do. We call that loyalty. That's what it means to follow Jesus Christ. It's not a, a decision. It's not a head knowledge. It's the fact that Jesus owns your life. I mean, we sing this in every dedication song we sing, don't we? I mean, we sing those words. All I have is Christ. Jesus is my life. That's the idea of trusting Christ. And some of you might be sitting here today going, I don't know that I can give my life to Jesus. I don't know that I could give my life for Jesus. Jesus. Who gave his life for you? I mean, that, that's what eternal life is. A life laid down so you have eternal life. And a response of gratitude and ownership of that is, your life's mine and do with it as you please. 
but I don't think Jesus is going to ask almost all of us to actually sacrifice our life for him. Rather, the call of this passage is orient your life to the way of Jesus Christ. Follow what he says. The actions that he calls us to obey these things. That's what it means to trust and give your loyalty to Christ. Followers of Jesus, Jesus' followers, follow Jesus. Trusting him. He gets our allegiance. And lastly, we do what he says. The wise one puts into practice. The wise one does. That's the verb. He does this. He is like the wise person, the one who does my teachings. Put these practices into practice by the power of the Spirit in conjunction with your fellow believers here in CC. We're not doing this on an individual basis. This is what the church is for. You might be sitting here today hearing this warning and you are a little worried. How can I know, Phil? How can, I, I don't want to walk out of here without a relationship. How do I know how can you tell? How can I do the assessment to see, is this me? Go back through this sermon and just look at what Jesus said and see, is your, or, your life oriented to this? Are you actually seeking reconciliation when you, you get angry with your brother or sister? Are you taking drastic measures to stop lust in your life? Do you mean what you say and tell the truth? Do you have a genuine love even for those who are against you? Are you seeking the wholeness of your heavenly Father? Do you help those in need expecting nothing in return? Do you pray and practice other spiritual disciplines, not to be seen by others, but as to demonstrate your dependence on God? Is the focus of your life on what will eternity last, or is it on the possessions of this world? Do you worry about the here and now or do you depend on your heavenly father to provide for your needs? Are you standing in judgment over others or are you first dealing with the sin in your own life so you can come alongside your brother or sister? Do you seek the will of God and knowing how to treat others and do you act toward others as you would want to be treated? These are all of the commands that Jesus has given us here. He says, this is my way. And I know it doesn't mean we're going to do all of those perfectly all of the time, but is your life, is that the direction? Is, is that the fruit? Is that what's there? I think this passage wakes us up, and I started last week's sermon with that kind of taxonomy of believers and unbelievers out of Grant Osborne's commentary and under the believers category, if you were here last week, we talked about the church is typically made up of regular attenders who have not really entered into a deep relationship with Christ revealed by their inactivity in the church. It's also made up of believers who are young Christians and just starting to grow, and then there are those who are the more mature, seeking to follow Jesus. Here's the point of Jesus' sermon to the, the church believers. He's, he really is calling us to inspect and examine our lives and the warning is to move those who would claim to be a follower of Christ to truly embrace Jesus Christ, to trust Jesus Christ, and it calls us into action with our lives. It's to move those in that first category and that second category to follow Jesus Christ and to embrace Jesus Christ and his way of life, not to settle into that, is that first group of regular attenders, are they truly believers? Well, that's the great mystery, right? I can't look in your heart. Only one gets to do that. But he gives us this sermon, the whole of Matthew 5 through 7, and Jesus calls us to, interest, to, to look introspectively, not to scare us, but to say, where's your life oriented? Because Trusting Jesus and following his way and building your life on that is to embrace his way. I close by saying this passage is actually my own personal testimony 
This passage, when I was 13 years old, and I know some of you might laugh or scoff at that, but when I was 13 years old, really woke me up spiritually. I was sitting in a middle school chapel service at Garland Christian Academy in Garland, Texas, and I heard a fire and brimstone evangelist. I'm not going to get into all of that, but he was fire and brimstone evangelist. Preach this text. I don't know that I would preach this text the same way he would, but he preached this text and the Spirit used those words to point out the fact that I, my life, as I took inventory of it, was deceived in all of these ways. I had the appearance of the Christian. I was the pastor's kid. I was, uh, you know, had, had all of that. I could make claims about the activities I had done and people I had led to the Lord and all of those sorts of things. I had an incredible knowledge of the Bible at a very young age. I was the nerd who would sit there with the Bible trivia game and pretty much memorize the entire game in elementary school. It was all up there. And while I had all of these, as I looked at my life that Friday morning, my life was all about self and not Jesus Christ. It was an appearance, it was a claim, it had a lot of knowledge, but it wasn't Christ. And that was evident in the choices that I was making with my life. And I needed Jesus' words, these very words, to exhort my soul, to warn me and to wake me up spiritually to trust and follow him. My goal is not to scare you, to cause you to doubt your salvation, but to use the very words of Jesus as he concludes this sermon to wake all of us up to trust and obey Jesus Christ. If I failed to do that, or if I would fail to deliver that message, then you could label me the false teacher because that's what the false teachers do. They give you the words you want to hear, but that's not what Jesus did. He gave his life and then he called us to give our trust to him. Let's close in a word of prayer this morning. As you have your heads bowed and your eyes closed, maybe you're sitting here today and you need to allow these words to take a spiritual inventory by the power of the Holy Spirit of your life and say, where is my life oriented? Honestly, you know, and yet you can be easily deceived. It'd be great to ask your spouse where your life is oriented, or your children. They probably have a very clear picture of it. But allow the Holy Spirit, through these words, to, to challenge and say, am I trusting this? Am I... Not, not perfectly with every single decision I ever make. I can't sin anymore. That's not it. But is my life about Christ? Do I want Jesus Christ? Is that the way of my life? Or isn't it? And use these moments, maybe even to, as your head is bowed and your eyes are closed, to pray and ask the very Holy Spirit of God to empower you and aliven you, maybe some of you to save you for the first time from your own efforts and your own self and to embrace Jesus Christ. And as the follower of Jesus Christ, to put you on this path again with your life. Lord, as we close our time this morning, It's not fun preaching warning texts, but it's, it is interesting to me that this is how Jesus ended his Sermon on the Mount. He didn't sugarcoat it. He didn't water it down. He, he came right at us, right at his audience. And he looked through uh, the appearance, and he looked through the claims, and he, he moved past the knowledge. And he warned us to watch out for the deception that we are so easily prey to. And so, God, I ask all of us to allow these words to sink in, to challenge, 
but to be used by the Holy Spirit to change our course, change our direction, change our trajectory of life back to Jesus Christ. And Lord, may we come alongside one another in this church and hold one another accountable. May we be transparent in our relationships with one another to allow others to see what are our struggles, to call us to embrace Christ afresh. And Lord, may our testimony and our witness be, yes, what we say with our words to be true. But Lord, as Jesus said here, for us to put those very words into practice with the decisions and the life choices we make and the way that we orient our life, may it be about the kingdom of God so that all of us one day will stand before you in judgment and we can look on our Savior and hear those words well done. To know that he knows us and we have that relationship with Jesus Christ. Lord, if there are any who question that or want more information about that, help give them the strength to, to, to come talk to one of us afterwards. Don't let anyone, Lord, walk out these doors without coming under the conviction of your spirit that today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to embrace Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for laying your life down for us. May we be people who give our lives as a living sacrifice to you to be used for your good pleasure. And may that be seen in the way that we live, the way we act, the way we orient our life to your way, we pray. Your name.